السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ بڑے ریسپیکٹڈ علماء کرام حضرت مولانا احمد الحق صاحب اور بلاوی دی امام صاحب اینڈ دی ریسپانسبل ممبرز along with all of these community members, my young friends. Alhamdulillah, it is a great honor to be among you today. Alhamdulillah, after a few years, when the last time I came, we had our Hazrat Mawlana Sheikh Tafadul Haqsa, Rahimahullah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive him, anybody who state us accept all of his good deeds and forgive his sins, insha'Allah, and Allah elevate his status, insha'Allah. After COVID, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed us to come together again, alhamdulillah. It is a great blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath in the Quran, a qasam, and he says, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ where he says about the beloved messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that you truly are a man of outstanding character. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his morals were of the highest calibre. This is the month of Rabi al-Awwal and as we come to the end of the month of Rabi al-Awwal, Dr. Siraj Sab and his team MashaAllah held this conference along with the Fuqbal that will, MashaAllah, graduate and be given certificates, Alhamdulillah, in the Masjid, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala accepted. Many different topics have been spoken about the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Taqwa of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophethood, his journey, and so many different things. Today, or tonight, I would like to talk about one part, and that were, or that was the morals of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why? Because I want to end this month of Rabi al Awwal with something that we can all take back, and something that we can all apply to our lives. And who is better, or who can be better than our beloved Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Is a hadith by and mention عن أبي سلمة رضي الله تعالى عنه عن أبي هريرة رضي الله تعالى عنه قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أكمل المؤمنين إيمانا أحسن خلقا that the most complete مؤمن in terms of his iman is the one who has the best akhlaq and the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم is Akhlaq were very, very high. Aisha radiallahu anha was once asked regarding his morals and she responded, his moral, and she very simply responded in very short words that his morals were the Quran. He would be angered due to it and he would become pleased due to it. That, kana khuluquhu al-Quran, that whatever was in the Quran, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam acted upon it. He was a walking, talking Qur'an. If you wanted to see the Qur'an being acted upon, then you could see the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If we look at his life, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not act upon 70% of the Qur'an. He did not act upon 90% of the Qur'an. You know, sometimes we see people and they say, I do some things and I leave some things. Shadi mein chal jata hai. chal jata The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was 100% upon the Quran. Subhanallah. The things that were mentioned in the Quran which displease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also displease Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the things which please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were also the things which please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In a hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, and it is narrated by An Abi Umamat radiallahu anhu, An Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and Nahu qal, 
من أحب لله وأبغض لله وأعطى لله ومنع لله that he who when he loves somebody he loves him for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he doesn't love him for his money he doesn't love him for his status but when he loves him he loves him for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as our brother just said for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we also love you for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah allowed that love to continue and Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be sincere in our love towards one another. And when he and when he gets angry with somebody, he gets angry and displeased with him because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because he is breaking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rules. Same thing with our children. Then it says, man that when he gives something, he gives for the sake of Allah, not because of his ego. That Allah has told me to help the poor. وَأَمَّا السَّائِلَ فَلَا تَنْهَرَ Do not push them away. So he gives for the sake of Allah. And وَمَنَعَ لِلَّهِ When he withholds, why does he withhold? He withholds for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That if I give this to my son, he may engage in haram. He may not do what is right with it. So I am not going to give it to him. Sometimes we see young children with phones watching cartoons and they're sitting in the masjid sometimes and the parents try to keep them busy. They become addicted to these phones from the age of two, three. You see them in the shopping cart, sitting in the shopping cart. They have a phone and they're watching cartoons. Everywhere they go in the car, no way can they function without a phone and a cartoon going on. From that young age, what they doing to their minds? They're frying their brains. So sometimes we will all do for for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though we feel like we should be doing certain things. Faqad istakmal al-iman. Faqad istakmal al-iman. That this person, when he does this and he's able to do everything for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you can say that his iman is now complete. The Quran does not only emphasize on song, zakah, salah, but also mentions mu'amalat. What is mu'amalat? Business dealings, transactions. When we deal with one another, somebody, he takes a loan, brother, I need $4,000. And now this brother is calling him, brother, with my money. What do I do And he is free when he deals. The Quran talks about this. The Quran, it talks about mu'asharat, social dealings. When you deal with your community members, when you deal with your family members, how do you deal with them? The Quran, again and again, it talks about ibadat. The Prophet wasallam he followed all of this completely. He did not do any shortcuts in terms of following it and justify his actions but he always did it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, my brother would say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He would not exact revenge on anyone for any personal reason. He never took revenge on anyone for personal reasons. Nor would he become angry on his own account. You can see when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is traveling with his wife and somebody accuses her, he does not get angry with her. He's so patient. Imagine what somebody else would have done. However, he would become displeased and very angry when people violated the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When they would engage in the hurumat, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would become angry for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when he would become angry, then at that point, no one would be able to confront him. He would very easily forgive those people who would personally abuse him. Don't we hear about the people who would curse at him? Don't we hear about the people who call him Sahib, Majnoon, Na'udhu Billah? They made all these names up about the Prophet Sallallahu but he did not go and confront them. The old lady who would put hurdles in his path and make his life difficult, yet when she became sick, what did the Prophet 
Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do? He went and visited her. He tormented and killed his companions, yet he did not take revenge. His uncle Hamza radiallahu anhu, who hinged the wife of Abu Sufyan at the time she was a Muslim, and her father had been killed in the Battle of Badr, and during the Battle of Uhud, she instructed Wahshi to throw the spear and kill Hamza radiallahu anhu, and she promised him a necklace and freedom and so on. And then after he was martyred, they cut his nose off, they cut his ears off, they cut his, took his eyes out, they took his liver out, and she chewed on it. And they did so many gross things to the beloved uncle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yet, when Wahshi he came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to seek forgiveness, he forgave him. When he said, please do not keep on coming in front of me because I remember my uncle when I see you and what you did. There was a lady, Sahabiya. Fatima bin Dimakhzumiyah ta'ala anha. The verdict was that her hands would be cut due to stealing something. So her family members, they decided to find someone who would go and do sifarish, who would go and do, who would intercede on her behalf in front of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. That maybe he will, who will he listen to that? Maybe she would be spared. So somebody said, you know, Usama is very beloved by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, why don't we send him? So they sent him, that please go and tell him that, you know, please spare her hands. Because the hand has already been set. So when he went and he said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that you know, the family is requesting forgiveness, please forgive her, please spare her hand for being cut. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam became very angry. And he said, Usama, that you have come to intercede on behalf of someone who the hudud of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been set upon. When a punishment of Allah has become confirmed, then there is no cancellation and there is no sifarish in it. Then it has to be carried out. Yes, she will be punished in this world, but she will be completely clear with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hereafter. Because there was proof of the crime, she admitted to doing it. There were witnesses who testified. Now the punishment had to be carried out. Those people who were destroyed, and then the Prophet ﷺ said that those people who were destroyed before you was due to this exact reason. That when the weak among you, they committed a crime, then they were punished. But when the rich and powerful among you, they were committed, they committed a crime, then they were forgiven. Let alone Fatima bin Maksumiya. If Fatima bin Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stole, then I would also cut her own hand, even though it was his own daughter. That I would do the same thing if my own daughter did this. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was very just and he was very fair. You know, sometimes we go to India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and they say, I went to the airport, they didn't check my documents and they let me through. And we get very happy, very important. And then the same people complain about the politicians that these people who not even there. If they were in their seats, what would they do? So if you want justice, then justice has to be across the board. You can't expect justice for, for, for other people and that you go free and you do what you want. The Prophet ﷺ was just with all people. So the Prophet ﷺ, he never took revenge for his own reasons. You know, sometimes when you hear people, and what do they say? They say, I will forgive, but I will never forget. I will forgive, but I will never forget. What kind of forgiveness is this? You clean the cloth, but it is still dirty. If you want to forgive, then you need to completely forgive. Otherwise, don't forgive. Right? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was the most courageous. He was the most generous. And he was the best of all individuals. He was never asked for something to which he responded in the negative. Meaning that he never said the word no to anyone. You know, maybe he said, I don't have it right now. And he's also taken loans from people. Sometimes he would tell Bilal that why don't you take a loan and give it? Right? The Prophet he would never say no to somebody. 
and night would not go by in the house of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam whilst he was in the possession of a single dinar or dirham, and this was out of his own choice, not because he had to. Not one night would go by, and that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had even one dinar or one dirham in his home. If any money remained with him, and he did not find someone to take it out to give it to by nightfall, he would not return home until he found someone to give it to. This is how the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was. Or ham hachubate, we hide it. Mattress ke niche. There was a brother whose home was broken into, and he said, "Alhamdulillah, my money was in very pesi but gay." So people asked him, "Kaise? How did you do that?" He said, "I had hidden it in my socks. Muzhe ke andar mein lapet ki chupa hua tha." One brother he passed away, and his children, when they were doing some construction upstairs, they found. Forty-five thousand pounds under the floorboards, and when you looked at Chacha, he lived a very simple life, purana, sofa, purana, everything. Right? And when his children got the money, what did they do? They come, they spent it. New car, the new was gone. This is our habit. Right? If he had given some to Sarah, and he had given, he would have benefited him in his grave too. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he would not take from Baitul Mal except for one year's provision. He would give each wife one year of dates and barley at the beginning of the year. And then many many times when people would come to ask him from his own personal home whatever he had given to his wife he would take from that and he would give it to them. So many times by the end of the Year before the end of the year, there was nothing left in his home. That's why it says that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, two months would go by and you would not see smoke coming out of the chimney. You would not see. What was his soup? It was vinegar. This is how simple the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was. And when we open the fridge and we don't find our favorite tropicana oranges, what do we do? We complain. Why is this juice not here? When we go to a dawat and we overfill our plates. And it's good food, and we throw it in the garbage. Wasting is haram, my brothers. This was not the way of our beloved Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. If you have food left, keep it and take it home with you. There's no sharam in that. That's what I do. I will take it back with me home, and I'll eat it the next day. How do we throw good food away? Look at the look at the recession coming now, and people feel it when they go to the grocery store and they have to pay four dollars for a dozen of eggs or more. If we don't thank Allah and we don't do shukr for the things that He has and take care of the things Allah has given us, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala can take it away very quickly. So these were the ahlaq of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was extremely generous. He was the most truthful in his speech, and he would not lie even when he was joking. You know the old lady who the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that old ladies will not go into Jannah. And he was joking, and she heard it. And she got really upset that I'm not going to go to Jannah. She began crying. And when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam found out, he said that tell her that she will not go into Jannah as an old woman, but she will be made younger, and then that she will be put into Jannah. He never lied, even when he joked. Even when he joked, he didn't lie. <laughs> What does Allah subhanahu wa taala say in the Quran? Inna shaknaun ilun shaa. That we have indeed developed these women with an excellent development, so we have made them as maidens. That Allah will make them young again before He puts them into Jannah. Let's also take a moment to see how she responded. <coughs> she did not. Who are you and why you men talk like this? But she very respectfully asked the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So there's a way of doing things. Ibn Abbas or the Allah or Anhu, you know, I want to ask you. There were four women who were promised Jannah by Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Who knows who these four women were? Anybody? Who were the four women who were promised Jannah by Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Seems like you're asleep, so maybe I need to ask you a question. Anybody? Four women. 
No? I will share with Hadith from Bin Khalas, but I'm, mashallah. The first one was Fatima binti Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a hadith that the best women among the people of paradise are number one, Khadija binti Huwaylid radiallahu ta'ala anha. The his first wife. Number two, Fatima binti Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sayyidatu Nisai ibn Jannah, the queen of the women of Jannah. Number three, Maryam bin the Imran alayhi salam. The, the mother of Isa alayhi salam. And number four, Asiya bin the Muzahim. She was the wife of Fir'aun. Who, these are the four women who had complete yaqeen in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they were great role models for the other, for the women to come until the day of, uh, until the day of the Yama. They all had complete yaqeen in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and look at the sacrifices that they all made. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was the most faithful in terms of fulfilling his promises towards other people. He was the most gentle in terms of his nature and he was the most honorable towards his family members. He was not just honorable towards his wife and his children, but he was also honorable towards his aunties. He was also honorable towards his uncles and his extended family members. If we look, sometimes some uncle has taken someone's inheritance. Now they're not talking to the uncle or because the father had some difference with his uncle. Now the son is not talking. In the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ, he says that if you, when your mother passes away, then her sister, you should treat her like your own mother. So I went to England just two months ago and every auntie, I made a point of taking something for every auntie. I have over 150 immediate family members and over a thousand cousins and relatives in England. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. And I tried, I couldn't take for everybody, but for as many people as I could, all the simkins were full of coming. Because I said, you want day to ask. You want to keep that bond. Right? And if they have, and we have a responsibility, they have a right upon us. So Alhamdulillah, they would come every few days, every day, every two days to come and see us. And, you know, before I came to America, I thought this was normal. But when you listen to the community and you hear how the situation is in household, you realize that this is not normal. So Alhamdulillah, we should work on this. Even if they're wrong, sometimes we need to let it go. For the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this was the way of our beloved Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What are we going to take with us in the hereafter? So we should try to forgive and we should try to forget and we should try to mend our relationships because sometimes because of the breaking up of two people the whole families for a very very long time will not know each other. Sometimes they will not know this my own uncle because of what happened many years ago. So it's very important that we mend our relationships. Sometimes we're very nice towards other people we meet in public, we meet at work, our boss. But sometimes with our own family members, we're very impolite. And we do not show good akhlaq. We need to show good akhlaq towards our own family members, my brothers and sisters. Because this is the right given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was the most forbearing. He was the most patient. And he was the most bashful individual. More bashful than a virgin in her quarter. And he was immensely modest and he rejected shamelessness or shame, shamelessness. He did not appreciate people who were shameful. He was always very, very modest, a lot of haya. And this is something that we are missing in this country today. And they've taken it to a whole different level. Right? So that, that when you lose your modesty, then do as you wish. When you become shameful, then do as you wish. Nobody cares. As a Muslim, we've been taught to be shameful. Right? To not be shameless. To cover ourselves properly. To show haya and so on. His eyes would usually be lowered towards the ground. You know the Prophet when he would look, he would, if he wanted to see, he would take a quick glance and he wouldn't stare at people, especially the opposite gender. In English, they say it's rude to stay. I remember I took my family to New York and we were on Times Square. 
And you see Ajit people there. And some people just standing there looking at people like that. <laughs> what is that? Is this what city life does to you? Alhamdulillah, Mokhi in Michigan. So, he was the humblest of all people. He would respond to all people. Whether they were rich, whether they were poor, or whether they were slaves, or whether they were free. And he used to think of himself as the lowest person. He used to think of himself as the lowest, not the person. You know? And, you know, sometimes when someone says, you know, I'm the lowest, they say, how he can you are the lowest. And see how he reacts. This is what Allah has have said. And if he reacts in a good way that, I am the lowest, then you know that he is true in what he says. But if he gets upset, then you know that he'll just come up. You know, sometimes when we're driving a nice car, and we see the car coming up next to us, and we say, yeah, yeah. and you look down on him, this is a sign of pride and takabur, and this is, you become sinful for doing so. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him and Allah has given you. But he did not give it to you so that you become proud of yourself. So we should be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Whatever Allah has given us, alhamdulillah. And at any moment Allah can take it. So we should not forget that. I remember when my uncle, he came to Florida, I was studying in India. So it was over 20 years ago. And there was one individual, old, Chacha there in the village and he invited us. His son used to work for my dad a long time ago. So he invited us all just to sit. And he came with a glass of water from the mud guy, you know. And I was gonna like how is, let me see how my uncle reacts. My uncle mashallah multimillionaire. I want to see how he reacted. And he drank the whole thing and he did not change his face. And I thought, subhanAllah, he is much better than I am. What do young people ask for today? I only drink mineral water. Right. But this is a sign of humility. He thought himself as the lowest. When an animal would be drinking and he would tilt the bowl of milk for this animal, for this cat, he would not move it until the cat was done drinking the milk. In the Sawali of Hazrat Maulana Abdul Rashid Ajmeri Rahimahullah, great scholar of India, it's mentioned that after eating watermelon, he would take the peel of the watermelon, what do we call it? Thermos. No, no. okay. I'll be translated for you. Watermelon. And he would take the skin. And he would cut it up into small pieces and then give it to that goat to make it easier for a goat to eat. SubhanAllah, how much care did they have? Our ulama, it mentions that when they would sleep, I think it was Malana Ashik Ilahi saw that he would put a towel on his pillow so that the oil from his head would not go into the pillow and make it difficult for his wife. How much they, they, they thought about these things and how considerate they were towards one another. He also mentions that when he had bread and roti and there was leftover, then he would keep this, he would make it into small pieces and go and put it at the ant's home or the ant hill where they would be able to benefit from this. This is how much he thought about the makhluk of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was the most forgiving towards others and he was the most honorable towards his companions. He would really host and take good care of his companions. He would not stretch his feet towards them. You know, before we used to go to people's houses, and sometimes we look at uncles and older people and we think, you know, that we, mashallah, the younger people think that we're so, mashallah, like we've advanced so much. I remember I went to a friend's house and he said, you're going to eat with me in Atlanta. I went and he said, you know what, I'll just meet you in the morning and we'll have donuts. Will our uncles ever do this? Our uncle would never do this. So we see the trend changing now. The Prophet ﷺ, he would be extremely hospitable towards his guests. Is it time? We have minutes. Five minutes. Okay. 
I remember I went to my dad's friend's house in Turkishwar, uh, next to Turkishwar. That's where I studied in India. And he was fine. He didn't ask, are you going to eat? He put out the food and he said, it's dinner time, it's lunch time. So I didn't need to ask you if you wanted to eat. The food was ready. This is how they go. Right? They were very considerate towards one another. He would really take care of his guests. He would not stretch his feet towards them. And that's why we should also stretch our feet towards the people. Because this is not the respectful way. But if he had to, he would ask them for permission beforehand. And when they would give permission, then only he would do so. If the space was constricted, then he would make room for his friends. He would not expect them just to sit anywhere, but he would make room and make them feel close to him. And he would remain in line with them. He did not like that he is in front of them behind him. He would mention actually that the, when I'm walking, you guys walk forward because behind me is the place for the angels who are walking behind me. So leave space for them, subhanAllah. And when someone would see the Prophet وسلم, suddenly they would become in awe of him. But only when they would sit with him and they spend time with him, their love would grow and grow and grow. And he loved me more than everybody else. This is what each Sahabi would think. This each individual would feel. His companions, they would sit around him and they would listen to him diligently. And if he gave an order to them, then they would fulfill it immediately. He would always initiate the salam and he would not wait for people to do the salam first. Sometimes we're walking in the groceries to our Muslim brothers and sisters this year and they look down and act like they haven't seen us. If we know somebody is a Muslim, then we should say salam to them. The best person is the one who initiates the salam. And when his companions were not there, he would notice the absence. And he would ask about them, he would call them. He would visit the sick. When he knew somebody was sick, he would go and visit them. And he would pray for their recovery. No wonder everybody loved him. If someone prayed, he would say, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun, and he would make dua for them. If he knew someone was parishan and they were troubled, he would go and inquire about them. That is everything okay? What kind of help can I give you? How can I be of assistance? Even if that meant going to that person's home. I don't know about in Hamtramic, I hope it's better, but where I live, nobody goes to anyone's home just like that. They have to first say, I'm coming to your home, are you available? Oh, sorry, I'm busy today. The person informal would, would go and, is he home? You know, we're visiting. I came to visit him. And he would frequent the gardens of his companions, and they would, and they would, uh, he would accept their hospitality. And they would be pleased by his beloved, blessed presence. He would honor the noble people and he would honor those who had some virtue. Sharif Logo ki Izzat or Ikram Kardete. He would not call people by their names or by their titles, but he would address them with their titles. And he would accept the excuses of people and he would not interrogate them. That's why when you look at the story of Tabu, and when the Sahaba came back and the Munafiqin gave the excuses, he did not interrogate them. He left it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The weak and the strong were treated equally. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because we have short time, that He allow us to read about the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam more and more, especially in this month, going forward. Sit down with our family members. Less time in front of the television. Buy a Sira book. Listen to it online. We have no excuse with our family members. If we want intercession of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the day of judgment, we need to know him. We need to bring their attention. When we say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the angel comes in and they present it before the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that so and so person is sending salutations upon him. So inshallah, this habit of sending salutation, making a habit of, we're going to send a thousand salutations this month, or five thousand offerings. 
And you, my son, you'll do 50, can you do 50, can you do 100 a day? How long will it take? But we make this habit a day per month. How many salutations have we sent? How many people yeah. will come into our homes? And if we read about his life, we will live our own life. And we will be closer to him. And inshallah, it will become easier to follow the Sunnah of Messenger. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept us. Protect us, protect our masajid, protect the ummah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take us from this world in a state in which He is happy with us. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alam.